So today I'm going to talk about a newer part of GiveWell's work that we're very excited about, our GiveWell Incubation Grants program. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the goals that we have for this program, uh, some of the different types of incubation grants that we've made, some past grants that are uh, good examples of the type of work that we're hoping to do with this program, and finally to put this program in a bit of the context of how GiveWell is evolving and some of our future plans. To start out, I just wanted to briefly introduce GiveWell. Uh, we're a nonprofit that is focused on finding and recommending outstanding giving opportunities. We publish a short list of heavily vetted, top recommended charities each year that meet our very strict criteria for being named a GiveWell top charity. Uh, these charities are uh, listed publicly on our website, so this research is available for anyone to use and we recommend charities that we think can have a very big impact with every dollar donated. Uh, we use four strict criteria to identify this group of top charities. The first criteria we look for in a charity is their evidence of effectiveness. There are two different types of evidence of effectiveness that we consider when we're looking for a potential top charity. The first is the evidence that the program that they're implementing is a very effective way to help people. Uh, that program evidence, uh, and what I mean by program is the independent way that a charity is helping someone. So an example of a program is distributing cash transfers. Uh, and any charity could potentially do that program, uh, but we first look at the evidence that distributing cash transfers is itself an evidence-backed way to help people. That's the very first piece of our evidence of effectiveness criteria. The second is the charity's own evidence that it is successfully reaching people uh, that it's intending to reach. Uh, this is often referred to as the charity's monitoring. So in the case of a cash transfer charity, uh, how does the charity know that it's actually reaching people who need cash? How do they know that the cash is being received? And maybe do they know how people are spending the cash to have a better sense of what sort of impact they're having? That's the first criteria we look for, the program evidence and the charity's own evidence that they are reaching people. The second criteria we look for is uh, the cost effectiveness of the program. So is looking to recommend things that we think can do a lot of good with every dollar that's donated. So we spend a lot of time uh, building complicated cost effectiveness models to think about how much we think each charity can do with a dollar. The third criteria we look for is the charity's transparency. So I mentioned that the end product that we produce is a list of recommendations that's available publicly uh, with the full case for why we recommend them available on our website. It's very important to us that charities be transparent both with GiveWell so that we can understand their work and the impact that they're having and also willing to share that work publicly. The final criteria we look at is the charity's room for more funding. And what I mean by that is we look for organizations that have significant ability to take in and use effectively funding for their programs. So we are looking for charities that are operating at a scale where they can take in a significant amount of money and use it well. And the reason that we care about that is that GiveWell's recommendations are used by many donors, so the charities that we recommend typically receive a significant amount of funding. So the scale and ability to absorb funds is really important to us. So we currently have nine top charities that meet these very strict criteria. Uh, they work on a variety of programs in global health and development, which we found uh, tends to be the area that meet the first criteria of evidence of effectiveness and cost effectiveness. But back in 2014, uh, we had been recommending a short list of top charities for a while that felt very similar. Uh, when going to look for new charities that met these four criteria, we weren't turning up as many as we thought that we might. Um, our list felt pretty familiar from year to year. Uh, we were somewhat consistently recommending uh, insecticide-treated nets to prevent malaria, uh, deworming treatments, and cash transfers. And so we started to wonder whether there was anything that we could do to try to find new potential top charities. And this was the genesis of the GiveWell Incubation Grants program, this desire to see whether we might be able to help grow the pipeline of potential top charities and to improve GiveWell's understanding of our own top charities. So in each case that we've recommended a top charity, uh, typically someone else has come in and funded the charity at an earlier stage. They might have supported that charity to grow from a very small organization that 
didn't have much of a track record, so something that GiveWell couldn't really assess to see whether we thought the charity was, was very impactful or that you know, wasn't operating at the kind of scale where they could absorb the amount of funding that we would expect to direct to them if we name them a GiveWell top charity. Um, or you know, maybe they've gotten funding to research their program to have some of that really strong evidence of effectiveness because another funder has come in and uh, helped them fund the studies that showed to GiveWell that the program is strongly evidence-backed. And so the goal of the GiveWell Incubation Grants program is to see whether we can step in as that earlier funder to help develop our pipeline of potential top charities. So kind of taking, taking this place where we see a promising opportunity and funding it uh, with funding that we receive from Good Ventures, which is a very large foundation that we work closely with. And so there are really three different types of incubation grants that we've made uh, historically in the last few years. Um, the first is the scaling type grant, so helping a very young organization go from being quite new, not having much of a track record, to scaling to the, to the point where we can look back at their track record and uh, really see whether or not they're having an impact. Uh, we've supported a few different organizations in this way, and I'm going to talk about one of them uh, in a bit more depth. Uh, a couple of them I wanted to highlight here uh, have come out of the effective altruism community. Uh, that would be Charity Science Health and Fortify Health um, are both organizations that we are interested in the incubation grants program. Uh, we also, and as a second type of grant, are interested in supporting the type of academic research that really helps us better understand whether a given program is effective. So something like funding a randomized control trial of you know, an insecticide-treated net. We wouldn't do that one specifically because there have been quite a few uh, studies on that already, but you know, something along those lines that really helps us get a sense of a program's effectiveness. And then the final, the final type of incubation grant that we're interested in is grants to support high quality monitoring. This is quite expensive for charities to do. Uh, it often involves uh, things like going back to recipients of a charity program to check on how the program uh, has been run. In the case of an organization like the Against Malaria Foundation, which distributes insecticide treated nets and, and is one of GiveWell's longtime top charities, uh, they go back to a percentage of households that receive nets check to see whether the nets are hung, what condition they're in, if they're being used. And so it's quite intensive, and many charities do not have the kind of monitoring that GiveWell wants to see to really feel uh, that we have a very strong case that we can make for a top charity recommendation. Um, so I'm going to talk, uh, give a few examples of each of these types of grants. Uh, the first is a gr the very first incubation grant that we ever made, actually, uh, to a group called New Incentives. We connected with new incentives uh, in late 2013 and made our first incubation grant ever to support their work uh, in January 2014. So they were a very young organization that was implementing a program that we were interested in. Uh, the program was a conditional cash transfer program, so giving people money conditional upon them uh, completing a set of actions. A conditional cash transfer program to uh, help prevent the mother-to-child transmission of HIV. Based on our preliminary research into this program, it seemed like it could plausibly meet GiveWell's top charity criteria in the future, but New Incentives was a very young organization and we didn't have you know, quite enough evidence to think that we should name them a top charity right now. And so we made an incubation grant to support their work and in particular their work to scale and research the program that they were implementing. Uh, in the course of the, the years after we made this incubation grant, New Incentives realized that there weren't quite enough pregnant HIV-positive women in the populations that it was serving to make that intervention a good fit for them to be implementing it. Um, they weren't reaching enough people uh, with that particular set of criteria, and so they broadened the focus of their program to serve all pregnant women. So they went from really focusing on pregnant HIV-positive women to try to prevent the mother-to-child transmission of HIV to encouraging women who are HIV-positive and also uh, did not have HIV to deliver in a health facility with the goal of reducing neonatal mortality. In late 2016, GiveWell decided to take a deep dive look at the evidence for the impact of delivering in a health facility to think about whether that was something that met our criteria and that we might be able to recommend. We ultimately concluded after looking at the evidence in that space that we did not believe that incentivizing facility delivery would meet GiveWell's criteria uh, due to the evidence that existed in the space then. But we had a very positive impression of new incentives as an organization after working with them for a few years. And so we provided an additional incubation grant to support their work 
to uh, switch into a new program, also a conditional cash transfer program, to incentivize routine immunizations in Nigeria. Um, GiveWell has long been interested in immunization programs, uh, and we thought that this might potentially be a, a way in which uh, new incentives could meet our top charity criteria in the future. We've also provided funding for a randomized control trial of this work, which uh, new incentives began in 2017, and we are on track to potentially consider new incentives for a top charity recommendation in 2020. So the timelines on the, these uh, incubation grants can be quite long, um, particularly if they involve some twists and turns along the way, uh, but we think it's a really exciting situation where we can find an organization that we think is really aligned with GiveWell, very interested in evidence, working to implement very effective programs, uh, and work with them to scale and learn from their programs. So we're currently in the process of uh, getting the RCT, the randomized control trial going of their work, and you know, hope to come back to them in 2020 or so, uh, depending on, on uh, when we have a sufficient evidence to consider them for a top charity recommendation. The next organization that I wanted to talk about uh, is a much more recent incubation grant. Uh, we made this grant in July of this year. Uh, and we're very excited about this one because we think it might help GiveWell solve a problem that we frequently have come up upon in our history. Uh, this is the problem of we, as I mentioned, the first step of our research process is looking at program research, so independent academic evidence that a particular way of helping people is an effective one, independent of a charity. The independent part of a charity uh, is where we get into some sometimes tricky situations where we'll find a program that based on the academic studies that have been done of that program, we think looks really positive. And we say, great, we are excited to consider moving forward with a charity that works in this program. Then we find out that there isn't a charity that works in this program and we, we're stuck. Um, since GiveWell uh, is a recommender of charities, uh, we can't really move forward without a charity to recommend. And so evidence action beta is itself an incubator um, that is, with this grant, creating a GiveWell-focused portfolio of promising programs that they are going to test and prototype and scale. So being the charity on the other side of this promising program equation where we sometimes have gotten stuck. And so the idea would be we can identify and chat with Evidence Action Beta about programs that we'd like to see charities working in, they can test, develop, and scale those programs, and hopefully we will uh, ultimately have new top charities as a result of Evidence Action Beta's work. Um, we also think Evidence Action is well positioned to run this type of program, as they are currently the parent organization of two of GiveWell's top charities and one of our standout charities. The final organization that I wanted to talk about uh, that we've made incubation grants to is a group called ID Insight. They perform a pretty different function than the other two groups that, that I've talked about so far, um, and are a group that we think will really help us fill in some, some gaps that we have when we're trying to do research. So as I mentioned, a lot of the research that GiveWell looks, out, looks at comes from academia. So there are these kind of big academic randomized control trials. Uh, these studies are very expensive, and they don't always give us a ton of information about the specific context that charities are operating in. You know, maybe the study was done in one country, but the charities that we're looking at are working in very different environments in very different countries. ID Insight is a group that specializes in providing decision-relevant research information to policymakers and decision makers uh, such that they can go and run a low-cost randomized control trial in a specific context to help get really that decision-relevant information. And we think that's a pretty unique role in the development space, since academic incentives aren't always perfectly aligned with the information that would be most helpful to give well to make a decision about which sorts of things to support in a particular context. And so we've made a grant to ID Insight to support an embedded GiveWell team to help us answer some of our biggest research questions. And ID Insight has been working with us on a number of projects through the years. Uh, I mentioned the, the group New Incentives uh, earlier. Uh, ID Insight is running the randomized control trial of New Incentives uh, conditional cash transfer program to incentivize immunization. ID Insight also uh, helped us answer some questions that we had about one of our current top charities, the Against Malaria Foundation, 
and the way in which the Against Malaria Foundation was conducting their monitoring. We realized that we had some questions where we didn't fully understand how their monitoring was being done. Uh, ID Insight did a couple site visits, went on the ground, watched AMF uh, do, against Malaria Foundation do their monitoring, uh, and reported back to us what they saw. And that was extremely valuable for GiveWell. Um, we're a team that is primarily based in San Francisco and focuses on synthesizing existing research. And so having a research uh, partner that can go out and collect information on the ground to help us answer important questions is a really exciting development for GiveWell. Uh, and to that end, one of the projects that we completed with ID Insight this year uh, is one that is intended to help us answer a particularly tricky question that GiveWell faces when we're trying to make charity recommendations. So I mentioned a few of the different programs that our top charities work on, uh, distributing insecticide-treated nets, distributing cash transfers uh, as an example of a couple of them. It's really hard to know how we should value those things relative to one another, but we are coming up with a list of bottom line recommendations where we need to think about which is the most cost effective, where, do the, where should we direct dollars today, which has the most pressing funding needs. And so we need to make trade-offs that think about the question of how do, how do we value a year of increased income relative to a year of healthy life. And that is very challenging to do. Uh, and one of the pieces of information that we feel is most missing from our ability to, to do that uh, is information about how people in the areas that GiveWell's top charities operate in, so people living in the poorest parts of the world, would make those trade-offs. Um, we've looked for this information, and we just don't believe there is a lot of research out there that would help us answer that question. And so one of the projects that we worked on this year with ID Insight was a project to have them conduct a pilot survey of people that lived in populations similar to those that receive uh, benefits from GiveWell's top charities to ask them how they might trade those different things off to help us better inform the way that we are making funding decisions and recommendations. Um, that project is still underway. We don't have uh, sort of a bottom line conclusion out of that yet, but we're, we're really hopeful that we'll get some information that will just help us make a really challenging uh, research decision um, with you know, better, better information available to us. Finally, I just wanted to um, kind of place this in the context of, of where we see GiveWell going in the future. You know, many people sort of know GiveWell as, as you know, the very rigorous, like randomized control trial focused organization uh, where we, as you know, like make very you know, strongly vetted lists of recommendations. But we're moving in a direction where we are open to things that are a bit riskier and the cases for impact might be a bit harder to measure. And we hope that GiveWell incubation grants can help us answer some of the challenging questions that come up as we expand the scope of the types of interventions that GiveWell is looking into. We're planning to do all of this with our typical uh, healthy dose of transparency. So you can see the full list of incubation grants that we've made so far. There are about 30 of them. So the, the three that I mentioned is a very small fraction of the total number of incubation grants that we've made. And uh, we plan to write you know, about the case for each grant, why we've decided that it's a good bet for us to take, uh, what we think the probability of success is, which outcomes we're going to be looking at to determine whether or not the grant was a success, and sharing, we'll be sharing all of that and have been sharing all of that on our websites so that we can continue to you know, bring the knowledge that we have to the people who are using our research and to others who are interested in effective uh, giving and effective interventions in global health and development. In addition, uh, one of the goals that we have for this program and, and GiveWell as a whole is really building incentives for people to generate very cost-effective charities. Um, we think that we are somewhat uniquely positioned to provide funding through the lifespan of an organization where uh, with the incubation grants program, we might be able to fund a very early stage organization, help it scale, study its program, maybe help fund monitoring uh, where that is an obstacle to us recommending something, and then ultimately move it to the Give Well Top Charities category where then significant amounts of funding are directed from the many people who use and rely on our top charities recommendation. So we hope that, that this is really a helpful incentive and you know, gives us more of a, more of a uh, role in sort of the full lifespan of a charity and its funding. Uh, I'm going to pause here because I know that we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I'll also be 
having office hours from 3 to 3.30 p.m. today and would love to continue the conversation about this or any other elements of GiveWell's work then. Uh, and in addition, I'll be hosting the Global Health and Development uh, Meetup at 5 o'clock. So if you're interested in talking to other people who are passionate about global health and development, uh, would also encourage you to consider attending that as well. But I'll pause here so that we have a few moments for questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Great talk. Um, we can take your questions coming in through the Bizabo app, or if you want to do that on the website, it is at london.eaglobal.org slash polls. london.eaglobal.org slash polls. Um, so I've been following GiveWell for a number of years. Always really admired how meticulous the research and the write-ups are. It's great stuff. Um, how many like new slam dunks have there been over the the years that GiveWell has been, uh, you know, since kind of that first wave of top charities. Are there, are there many new ones that have come into that level? Yeah, so there was a period of time which would be from about 2011 to 2015 when we had three to four of the same top charities. So this was sort of the period that GiveWell Incubation Grants was getting started in, and um, we really had, you know, the, the AM, we had AMF, the, the distribution of insecticide-treated nets, we had Give Directly uh, distributing cash transfers, and we had two deworming charities, one to two deworming charities, depending on which year, uh, Deworm the World Initiative and, and Schistosomiasis Control Initiative. We now have nine top charities, um, so we have added you know, an additional group of them. Uh, two of them work on deworming as well, and the rest work on other interventions. So um, we've added a vitamin A supplementation top charity and a seasonal migration subsidy top charity, and another uh, malaria charity that works on a different intervention uh, of distributing preventive anti-malarial drugs. So we have found new top charities. Um, it's not quite as the list hasn't been quite as stagnant as it was at the period where incubation grants was just getting started. Uh, but we do think, you know, these have all been um, in fairly similar, uh, you know, within the kind of similar global health and development context, uh, a lot of like direct delivery interventions, and they've all been in a fairly similar band of cost effectiveness. Um, our top charities, we generally consider to be around four to 10 times roughly as cost effective as Give Directly, which is the cash transfer charity that we use as a benchmark. And so we are particularly interested now in really finding things that could beat that cost effectiveness, that band of cost effectiveness by a significant amount. And so we're looking into a lot of different areas with, a, with an eye toward finding things that might be much better than GiveWell's current top charities in terms of cost effectiveness, even if they might be much harder to assess. And, uh, one thing we're looking at just in, in that area is policy advocacy type organizations, which we think have the potential to be quite cost effective. Since you mentioned that, I was going to ask a question about things that are less tractable and, and harder to assess. Uh, a favorite author of mine, Tyler Cowen, who was, I think, the first person from which I ever heard cash, cash, cash as a giving mantra, recently published a book in which he basically argues, and Rob Wiblin did a, a podcast with him not long ago that's fantastic, very much worth a listen, but he basically argues that maximize economic growth subject to certain human rights constraints is kind of his overall sense for like what you know, a good uh, policy directive is. How do you guys think about things like growth, which obviously brings so much of the value but is really hard to figure out? Yeah, so I think the question with a growth intervention would be like, what could we support, um, which isn't always clear. Um, and I think for things like systems change or just where they're maybe much more nebulous in terms of what the, what the things are that we could do as a, as a charity recommender, as a funder, um, I think that's the core challenge is thinking about where we would put dollars to have the impact. Uh, and I think right now, while we are expanding into things like policy advocacy, uh, we still are committed to publishing very vetable recommendations where the full logic for the case of why we recommend something is out there. So I think while it might be harder for GiveWell to assess something and it might take us more time to fully understand the case um, and you know, it might be a little bit trickier, we're not yet at the point where we want to say, just trust us, we're gonna try this really out there thing where there isn't much evidence. We're still quite far away from that. We're still very committed to evidence, but we're committed to looking at evidence bases that are more complex than perhaps we have in the past. Cool. Uh, number of questions have come in. One on the topic of deworming. Um, 
and you guys may have a, a point of view that's a little bit different from the questioner, I don't know, but the question is, would it be highly effective to fund RCTs on deworming given that there seems to be so much uh, uncertainty? Yeah, so one of the incubation grants that we did make in the past was to uh, support the uh, follow-up study to one of the earlier deworming studies that was done. So uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with the case for deworming, uh, Givol's recommendation rests on research that suggests that children who receive deworming treatments have much higher incomes later in life. Um, and there's a lot of questions and debate about this particular set of evidence. A challenge with running new randomized control trial today, there, there are basically two challenges. Um, one is the time span, since the effects that we're particularly interested in happen decades later, uh, you wouldn't get results that would answer this specific question for quite a long time. Uh, and the other is just the power, uh, the size of the study that would be needed to have the statistical power to answer the question that we'd want to see. It would be a very expensive study as well. And so we've primarily been interested in exploring whether there are existing deworming studies that we could follow up on today. So things that were done far enough in the past where maybe today we could see if we can get information about how those children are faring. That's quite challenging in and of itself to track people down who participated in studies in the past and see how they are today. But I think that would be our best guess as to the way to, to do this given those other challenges with running a new study. Gotcha. Uh, number of questions coming in. I don't think we're gonna have time to get to them all, but let's go through as many as we can. Um, here's a good one. Should we donate now or later? Should we expect that better opportunities will be just around the corner given all the work that you guys are doing? Yeah. It's a, it's a good question because we are trying to find things that are significantly more cost effective. Um, you know, that being said, this is a we're pursuing a lot of new areas, so not yet sure whether we'll find things that are much more cost effective, whether we'll find things that are similarly cost effective, whether we won't find things that are more cost effective and today's opportunities are the best. Um, we do think that the opportunities we have today represent very evidence-backed, like excellent ways to do good, and we are extremely excited for people to support them and believe that they have very large funding needs, um, you know, on the order of several hundreds of millions of dollars that we don't expect to fill with our current donor base. So as, you know, excited as we are that we moved $117 million to our top charities in 2017, we think that their needs are, are even greater. And so uh, we certainly see a strong case for giving today as well, uh, but we may well find things that are more cost effective in the future, and that, that is certainly one of our goals. So uh, I hope that level of uncertainty isn't uh, too dissatisfying, but I think it is the true yeah. truth of where we are. Don't let and I think we are, I'm getting a, I, oh. I think we're at a time for the question. Time is almost up. All right, yeah. we'll do one uh, more here before we get off. We did start a minute late as well. And we've got those long breaks so we can borrow a minute. Um, what is the hit rate that you think you will find on these incubation grants? And how do you think about, you know, how speculative something should be as yeah. you fund it? So we don't yet know the hit rate. I think because of the timelines that I mentioned, uh, we just haven't seen all of the incubation grant or very many incubation grants sort of through their life cycle to where we would get to a top charity from making an incubation grant since it's a multi-year process. And we started incubation grants in 2014, but have really ramped it up in recent years. So there aren't that many older grants where we can see you know, whether they've led to top charities yet. So I don't know what our current hit rate is very well or have very good information about that. Um, in terms of the, you know, how do we think about whether an opportunity is a good one to pursue, we really try to ask ourselves the question of what is the likelihood this becomes a top charity? How cost effective does it seem now? Um, what is the likelihood we get information about the questions that we care most about? And so we're really trying to find things where we think there is a plausible case that they're going to be as cost effective or much more cost effective than our current top charities. And we're taking a lot of similar steps that we do during our top charity reviews. Um, we do cost effectiveness calculations to, to get our best guesses. Uh, we spend a lot of time investigating each grant, sort of similar to how we do a, a charity review, and have plans for following up um, you know, published on our website, as well as our predictions for the success of each grant and the percent likelihood of success and when we'll see it. So like, for example, I believe on the new incentives grant page, it says, you know, we think there's X percentage chance that new incentives becomes a top charity by 2020 or 2022. Uh, and similarly with some of the other um, grants that we've made, you'll see predictions along those lines to help lay out where, where we think it is and how it fits in. Yeah, nobody has to guess as to what you are guessing. So that's <laughs> yeah. great. Um, she will be having office hours at 3 o'clock today and also hosting the Global Health and Development Meetup from 5 to 6. 
thank you for all your hard work figuring out where should we should be donating our money. How about another warm round of applause for Catherine Hollander? Thank you. Thanks so much.